So in the previous video, we left off with the idea that platelets are going to be involved in blood clotting, one of their major functions. And this is something we're going to be highlighting in much greater detail in this next flowchart. So we'll entitle this next flowchart, Blood Clotting. And this is going to be highlighted and shown very nicely in figure 42.18. So be sure to look at that figure as we go through this. Blood clotting is going to be a very important process within any individual that has a circulatory system. You want to make sure that the blood that's within the circulatory system stays within the circulatory system. You don't want blood leaving that area. So what you have to do is you have to clot. You have to prevent blood from sort of leaving the body and going externally somewhere where it's not supposed to be. And in order to do that, there are two major steps of this process. This is really, really important to understand because it's what allows blood to stay within the system, within the vessels specifically. So both of these steps are going to be highlighted and one will happen before the other. So when we're looking at blood clotting, the first major thing that happens is known as the platelet plug formation. That's the first sort of step in order to have blood clotting successfully occur. So we'll write that down. It's a platelet plug formation. So our first job in blood clotting scenario is to make this a platelet plug. And this is actually going to be considered a temporary clot. So it's definitely not permanent. It's a temporary clot. It's basically the first response to some sort of damage that happens to a blood vessel. So let's take a look at what happens. Initially, you obviously have to have damage. A blood vessel specifically should be damaged, and that's what will happen first. So let's say we have blood vessel damage. This is just like any scenario where you cut your skin or get a paper cut. You have damaged blood vessels that are within your finger or within your hand, whatever and wherever it may be. That damage is going to trigger the following immediate reaction. The first immediate thing your body does is when it senses that a blood vessel has been damaged, lacerated, something has gone wrong with the blood vessel and its, uh, its overall structure, it's going to immediately constrict that blood vessel. And constrict is the opposite of dilate. That would mean that it prevents blood flow at this blood vessel. So we'll state that constricting a BV, a blood vessel, dramatically decreases blood flow. And this is good because right now you have an opening, a damaged blood vessel. You're basically letting blood out of the body. It's going onto your skin and you want to stop this at, in, at any way you can. And this is the first step to constrict the blood vessel to make less blood leave this damaged blood vessel and go into the extracellular environment. Okay, so now once you've constricted this, this is not enough. There's still going to be some bleeding. As we all know, when you get a paper cut, yes, the bleeding may subside over time, but it still bleeds. So what do you have to do next? The next step in making a platelet plug is the following. There are going to be, whenever you have blood vessel damage, structurally speaking, the blood vessels contain collagen within them. And what's going to happen is that collagen fibers, which are structural components within these, these blood vessels, they're going to actually start to stick out. Collagen fibers are going to be sticking out at specifically whatever damaged area we're focusing on. Now, this may not seem like it's going to help anything, but this is going to be an indirect response and it's going to result in a direct effect on this idea of creating a clot, a stopping of this blood flow. How so? If you have these collagen fibers sticking out, this actually becomes a very, very nice thing for something like platelets, which again, are those pinched off pieces of cytoplasm from bone marrow cells that are floating around with the blood and the blood cells, platelets themselves are going to notice these collagen fibers sticking out. And these, which are also found within blood, they are not blood cells, they're not red nor white blood cells, they're their own little structures. These platelets within the blood are going to stick to these collagen fibers. They become attracted to them and they stick to the collagen fibers, therefore. So upon sticking to these collagen fibers, you're starting to create a platelet plug. That's the name, platelet plug formation, because again, this is a damaged blood vessel, and we're doing these things in order to stop the blood from leaving the blood vessel, to sort of confine it and clot it to one area. So once you have the sticking to the collagen fibers, this actually forms what we can consider a physical block to blood, uh, let's say blood leaving the body. So it forms a physical block. Once you have done that, you are well on your way to creating a platelet plug. As this physical block continues to form, you're going to have the following uh, next effect. The platelets themselves that are here, they're going to be releasing these structures, these chemoattractants called attractants. 
So they are going to be these molecules that will attract things to this site, this physical block that's being formed. Once the platelets are releasing these attractants at this area of the platelet plug, this is going to recruit even more platelets. So this is just a, a signal that tells even more platelets to come to the area. So it recruits even more platelets to this damaged area that's already physically blocked, but we want even more blockage. And in addition, these chemotractants make the platelets even stickier. And that's good because you want to really, really sort of uh, close this damaged blood vessel. You want to make sure that it does not have any openings whatsoever. And so you have these sticky platelets. You have lots of them coming here. You're really making sure that a plug is being formed. And that's our final sort of step to really reach this platelet plug formation. Overall, these entire steps will then culminate in forming a platelet plug that's our first step in any sort of blood clotting scenario. And a platelet plug, just remember, is also going to be temporary. It does not last long. The reason why we have a temporary platelet plug form initially is because all of this is done in an attempt to prepare for the second major step. This is going to be the initial response that allows the necessary time for the secondary, more permanent response to occur successfully. So as this is occurring, simultaneously, number two, the other major step will be preparing itself. And that would be the fibrin clot formation. So let's take a look here. A fibrin clot is going to be different than a platelet plug because it is going to be a stronger, more permanent clot. And that's what we want. We need to really make sure that this blood vessel stops bleeding, stops bleeding externally, and make sure that the blood stays confined within the circulatory system, as it should be. So let's take a look at the steps that occur here. So when you want a fibrin clot, a more permanent clot to form, what's going to happen is there are going to be these structures, these molecules known as clotting factors. These are separate from everything we've seen thus far. Clotting factors and a couple of different other compounds are going to also be released, but mainly clotting factors by the platelets themselves. So the platelets that are already here, they're going to release those chemoattractants, yes, but they're also going to release these clotting factors and also the damaged cells that are in this area of damage are going to also release, release these clotting factors as well. What are these clotting factors going to do? These clotting factors are going to directly result in the conversion of one substance to another. But before we get into that conversion, I just want to put a star here. There's a good clinical, uh, clinical note that we should have with this idea of clotting factors. Clotting factors within the body, there are, about over, there are over 30 clotting factors within the body. But clinically speaking, some people may be missing one. And so if you're missing any of these clotting factors, let's say, this is actually going to put you at a distinct disadvantage for this type of blood clot formation. So over 30 factors, if you're missing any, this leads to a condition known as hemophilia. So let's write this down. Hemophilia. And so, for example, those people who suffer, this is usually a genetic disease, those people who suffer from hemophilia A, let's say, for example, there's a couple of different types of hemophilia, they are actually going to be missing the specific clotting factor known as clotting factor 7, CF7. So that's just a good clinical note to be aware of. But let's say you're all good. You have all 30 factors. Um, what's going to happen next? This is going to trigger the reaction or the conversion of the following molecule to the next molecule. We're going to have this molecule known as prothrombin that's going to then be converted to thrombin. And the conversion is happening specifically because clotting factors are sort of pushing this reaction forward. So this is basically a response to these clotting factors being released. That's what causes prothrombin to turn into thrombin. Now, what is prothrombin? Prothrombin is a plasma protein. Remember, the plasma contains many proteins, no cells, just a lot of proteins. This is a plasma protein that's specifically going to be produced in the liver. And it's also important to recognize that this plasma protein cannot be formed unless you have vitamin K. So you need 
vitamin K being produced nicely by those um, commensal bacteria that are within your large intestine. This is why vitamin K is very important in the blood clotting scenario and promoting blood clotting. So we have this plasma protein called prothrombin. It's basically an inactive form of thrombin. Pro means early or first. So this is the first form of thrombin that's converted to thrombin if you have clotting factors being released. Clotting factors are going to cause this to be sort of converted to this thrombin form. What is thrombin specifically? Thrombin is going to act as an enzyme and it catalyzes the conversion of, let's write this down, catalyzes enzyme, comma, catalyzes conversion of, and let's continue our stepwise arrangement here. So we've had thrombin, that was sort of a side note here. Now we have thrombin, now we're going to continue. What does thrombin catalyze the conversion of? We're going to have another conversion here of a molecule known as fibrinogen. This is actually a soluble plasma protein, meaning that it is found within the plasma, it can move within the plasma freely, and it's going to convert into because of thrombin, as a result of this enzymatic catalytic conversion, fibrinogen will convert itself to what is known as fibrin. Notice this is fibrin clot formation. We have formed the molecule that we needed. And fibrin, I'll tell you, is insoluble. Now you have to ask yourself, why are we going from a soluble substance to an insoluble substance? The key idea here is that we're trying to do blood clotting. We're trying to stop bleeding. We're trying to stop blood from possibly leaving. We need to create a really sort of thick and strong uh, barrier to bl blood leaving this blood vessel. That's why we use something that's insoluble, something that blood really cannot sort of push through or mix with. And fibrin is that insoluble substance that's created from originally a soluble plasma protein known as fibrinogen. This is only going to occur if thrombin is successfully being made. Thrombin is only successfully made if clotting factors are successfully being released by those platelets at the platelet plug. So notice the interconversation that we have between both of these steps. Okay, so now we have fibrin. It's insoluble. What's that going to do to the overall formation of this fibrin clot? It's going to really get this whole process completed and, and started. What we're going to now have are a bunch of fibrin monomers in this area of damage. Those fibrin monomers will polymerize, and polymerize just means combine together to form a fibrin polymer. And a fibrin polymer is what we want. We want lots of fibrin mixed together with itself at this damaged blood vessel to really create some sort of long, a, a very strong clot here. So once we have this polymerization, this is going to create long threads of fibrin. And long, these, fibrin, these fibrin molecules are very fibrous, that's the name fibrin. Long threads of fibrin are going to stick to the damaged vesicle, to, to the damaged vessel, I should say. And so once they stick to the damaged vessel, this is good or bad. In this situation, it's good. We want stickiness. We want to close this vessel, the damage that's there. And this is going to directly cause the trapping of blood cells, further trapping of blood cells that are initially that were initially leaving because of the injury, and also further trapping of platelets. And this is then going to subsequently finally result in the formation of a fibrin clot. So this forms a fibrin clot, and again a fibrin clot, you can already tell here it's a lot more strong and stabler, and therefore it is more of a permanent clot that really prevents bleeding uh, from occurring. This was just a temporary thing to really allow this process, which takes a little bit more time, more enzymes involved, more reactions involved, to really complete itself. And that covers our look at blood clotting. One final thing I just want to speak about that's uh, besides or outside of this uh, pathway of blood clotting is the idea of anti-clotting factors. These are things that prevent blood clotting, actually, and these are found within us in a healthy individual. This is because you want to prevent blood clotting spontaneously. You don't want blood clotting to happen spontaneously without injury. That's bad. And if it does form without injury, what we sometimes refer to that is a thrombus. So if you have the bad functioning of anti-clotting factors, if they're not working correctly, you may form a thrombus. A thrombus is just a blood vessel clot that may block blood flow. So anytime you think of a thrombus, think of that as a, uh, as a sort of bad clot that's been a result of anti-clotting factors not working correctly. They're sort of off, let's say, and you have these blood clotting factors working too much at the wrong time. It creates a block in the blood vessel known as a thrombus. This may cause a backflow or a block to blood flow, which is not good.
This is typically when we have people take blood clot medication to prevent thrombus formation. And that covers our look at blood clotting. In the next video, what we're going to be looking at now is the idea of this a little bit more, the idea of cardiovascular disease.